Welcome to Interviews from Mexico. I'm Laura Carlson, and I'll be your host as we look at cutting edge issues with the men and women who know them best, here on Telesur. On February 19, 2006, there was a methane explosion in the mine Pase de Conchos in the northern state of Coahuila. Sixty-five miners were trapped underground. Twelve years later, only two bodies have been recovered. For the families of the miners, the accident represented a tragedy that still hasn't reached closure. Today, on Interviews from Mexico, we'll be talking about the legal battle today mine safety, and the family's fight for justice. To talk about this issue, we're very privileged to have with us here in the studio, Rodrigo Olvera. Rodrigo, thank you for being with us here on Interviews from Mexico. Rodrigo is a lawyer for the organization Families of Pasta de Conchos. Rodrigo, 12 years later, and the latest report shows that the government has not carried out a serious investigation into the causes of the tragedy, that there have been no prosecutions, and that we still have not recovered the bodies of 63 miners that were trapped in the rubble. What is the situation in the legal battle today? The families have been fighting for truth, justice, and reparation for 12 years. And they still haven't gotten it. They brought lawsuits and filed criminal charges. In the criminal case, as a form of indemnity, the company offered a payment in exchange for dropping the charge. It's important to mention what this company is. It's Grupo Mexico, the largest mining company in the country, right? Exactly. One of the richest men in the country. But also associated with the well-known U.S. company Azarco, a very important company. Also in Peru. In mining disasters. Exactly. They cause environmental problems in Sonora. They have trains. Well, it's an enormous company with a lot of resources. And with all that money, uh, they didn't want to invest in safety. So, but the company and those in the government who protect them have made sure that there won't be any criminal charge against anyone. But so what they did is try to offer payments like hush money to the families exactly. without going through a criminal procedure. There was a criminal trial, or rather, there were preliminary hearings before the public prosecutor, or the equivalent of the prosecutor. And just by paying what they unilaterally decided will be the indemnity payment, with that, they stopped the criminal trial from going any further. They didn't even let the families testify. They just assumed that the families had already forgiven them after receiving money. But the families are still organized, and they're still pressing for answers. What are their demands today? There are several demands. The most important one is that the remains return to the families. That is the first thing the families want. What does that mean to a family, not to have the remains? They know that at this point their loved ones are dead. Um, why is this so important to a family? Most of these families are very religious families. Mm -hmm. Being able to bury a loved one according to your religious beliefs is very important. The families tell us this isn't a question of pesos, it's a question of love. I can leave him buried in the rubble. This company and the government have done so much to not return the remains of their loved ones that they feel that the company thinks it owns the bodies. And that's very hard for people. As if it were private property and... Exactly. And, and of things. things. 
They treated them like what them when they were alive. And they keep treating them like now that they're dead, like objects. What are the reasons that the company gives for not um, removing the bodies? It's very interesting. Uh, this year we published a report that reviews all the documents that are in Coahuila coal mining between 1900 and September of 2017. More than 3,100 workers have died and their bodies were recovered, except for the 63 of Pasta de Conchas, and one more in the 60s, that the company didn't recover. That happened in Mine 6, also property of Grupo Mexico. This is the only company that doesn't think it's important to recover the bodies of workers who die because of their negligence. That's, that's quite a statement regarding the attitude of the company toward its own workers and their families. Now, in, in this case, what was the reason that they gave for not going in? And are there no legal ways that you can pressure them to actually carry out this, this task of searching for the bodies? It was... It was completely humiliating. The company said that it was recovering the bodies, but what it was really doing was rebuilding the mine so they could keep extracting coal. When they got to a part of the mine where they suspected that if there were survivors of the explosions, that's where they would be, because it was where a part of the mine had collapsed. Preventing, and when they got to the part, they gave the order to leave, and they called off the operation to recover the bodies. We suspect, we don't have proof, but we suspect that they did find some remains there, which shows that the workers didn't ride right away, and we think that's what they don't want us to know. The reason they gave was that a forensic specialist from the United States came to the mine and said that it wasn't safe to recover the bodies because there will be probably water which could be contaminated with AIDS and the rescuers will be infected and they will infect their wives and their wives will infect the whole state of Coahuila. That was the official reason to call off the rescue efforts. It insults intelligence because AIDS doesn't get transmitted like that through water, it doesn't live for that in such an environment. But also, it suggests that the wives of the workers are promiscuous, which is it, a huge insult. AIDS, that's a bizarre scenario. And that was a forensic specialist that worked for the company, for the Federal Secretary of Labor of Mexico, Javier Lozano, had approved him as legitimate, and he sided with the company. The families asked for injunctions against the decision. And the judges said that not receiving your husband's body doesn't affect your rights. That's what they say to the families. With that, they said, we're not protecting you, and we're not ordering that the bodies be rescued. It's, it's amazing to me that with all these setbacks, with the humiliation and with, with all the obstacles that they've faced, both from the companies, the company itself, Grupo Mexico, and from the government, that this group has remained organized. What has been... Uh, the motivating factor that has kept the families together 12 years later. One of the main leaders of this organization, the Pasta Conscious Families Organization, is Doña Trini, who is the mother of a worker who's still buried in the mine, Raúl Villasana Cantú. Her name is Trinidad Cantú. And when all of the injunctions in Mexico were being lost, when there was no longer a legal path in Mexico, but there was still a way internationally, we asked the families, do you want to take the international route? It's very expensive, very slow, and very difficult. And we can't be sure that it will be successful. And she said, I can't die knowing that there was something I could have done that I didn't do. It might not work, but I need to do everything that's possible to do. The motivation is love. And there are many family members that followed her with the same... It's the same idea. I can't leave them there. It will be abandoning them. I can't betray my family like that. You mentioned the international route for, for pressing their legal case. What is that and where is that now? There are 
grand two main paths. Since 2006, 2006, in March of 2006, a month after the explosion, the family filed a complaint with the support of a union, which wasn't the mining union, but the highway and branch workers union. They brought a complaint before the International Labor Organization. The government's defense was, we're not responsible for every accident that happens in the country. And the ILO responded that there was so much negligence and emissions that could have prevented the disaster that in this case, yes, you are responsible. And every year they follow up with a series of recommendations to improve security because the families also say, I don't want this to happen to someone else. What happened to my son? We need to make it doesn't happen again. And also, how do we know it was an accident if there hasn't been an in-depth investigation? Yes. And for the main men of the families, which is the recovery of the bodies, the issue is before the Inter-American Human Rights Commission, because the state violated rights to life, personal security, and personal integrity. But he also violated the rights to justice, truth, and the reparation of damages to the families. In addition, I read that there were several family members who said that their uh, loved ones, minors, had reported a gas leak before the explosion. Is there evidence that this could have been prevented? All of that evidence is in the case before the International Labor Organization. For years before the explosion, the Secretariat of Labor car carried out several inspections, detected multiple violations and said specifically that they put life at risk. They didn't stop working there, even to, it was their duty to do so. So what, that's why the ILO said you're responsible. But the unit that should protect them didn't protect them either, because the union threatened to stri strike because of the lack of safety this is the miners union. The National Union of Mine Workers. Mm -hmm. But instead of going on strike or informing the workers that had been the fundamental right to refuse to enter the mine until it was safe to work there, that is in the law, the right that's are to refuse to enter, instead of informing them, the union let the workers continue working in exchange for money from the company. That's a, a quite a, a major complaint against the very organization that should have been representing the miners' interests as well. So they had the company against them, they had the government basically against them, and they had the miners' union also not defending mm -hmm. their rights. When you went back in this latest study for the 12 year anniversary and you looked at mining disasters from 1900 to, to date, what kind of a pattern did you see? Is this an anomaly what happened at Pasta de Conchos or is this something that has been repeated throughout history? Oh, this is the story of all of the many families. Talk to any of them, they all will tell you. My dad died in the explosion in the 80s and my grandfather died in the one in the 50s. Never. Among the more than 3,000 workers who have died in coal mines, has a single person been put in jail for negligence? Not one. Not a single person. Not a single court ruling punishing anyone for the deaths. But also, in the oldest cases, we have found by old, I mean about 30 years ago, which is not that long ago, but they didn't even pay reparations to the families. They told many widows, you don't have the right to anything. There are cases, and we review them in our report, where the houses, where they lived, they were property of the company, and when the workers died, they kicked out the families, saying the house is ours, we have to give it to another worker. That's cold. It's terrible. In Mexico, social security is mostly concentrated in the Mexico Social Security Institute. The mining union was created in the 30s, 1934. Social security was created in the 40s. And there were no protection under social security under the governmental organization until the 70s. 
The union allowed the workers' human right to social security to be violated for 30 years. And when they finally got it, it wasn't because of the union. It was because of a decision by the president of Mexico. And this was just for minors? Workers, and specifically in this area, coal miners. But the question of social security was on the national level. They didn't let anyone join, independently of what metal they extracted. So there is a complete story, as the families have learned, of, uh, of impunity. When we arrived at the area as human rights defender, what they said to us was, it's always been this way, and it's always going to be this way. And the way that the families explain what happened to them, well, at least this is the way they used to explain it. They said, it's because the worker steals from the land. So the ground gets its revenge by killing them. And what the past that the Conscious Family Organization has done with human rights education is to say, no, the land is not the one killing them. It's the impunity and greed of the businesses who are protected by those who should be protecting the workers. It's a kind of fatalism that they often talk about being characterized It makes sense, because if not, you can go insane. Yeah. But as you start understanding that it's not destiny, it's not written in the stars, it's not God who wants the workers to die, but that's greed. Is the lack of investment in safety from the companies, the negligence of the government inspectors, the silence of the unions. When they understand that, their attitude changes. And that's what we've seen from the 2006 to today. The families who have always been afraid to speak out are saying, are saying now, my main is dangerous, my main is dangerous, come and do something. Oh, so you actually have a network now where they report dangers in other mines. That's right. Can you explain how that works and how you broadened from the Pasta de Conchos case to this other work within the mining sector? The families react to the tragedy in a different way. There are some families that keep reacting in a traditional way and simply swallow their pain uh, within their own circle. There are families who sought out the protection of the government. There are families who sought the protection of the union. And there are some families that said, we need to organize ourselves. And those families started to document well, they kill my son, I don't want them to kill my neighbor's son. And they started to identify which other mines were dangerous. And two years later, a mine worker, an old one, very wise, with a lot, lot of life experience, told us, you always get here late. You get here after the accident. You have to get here before. Of course. So the whole organization transformed to work on prevention. And we created this network where a worker who knows the mine or his wife who, when he gets home, he tells her about, or his daughter, they call our organization and say, this mine loca located in such and such place is very dangerous. Do something. So the families, we're not going to do the government's job. What we do is go to the government so that they do their job. And this way, in the last four years, the inspections have improved significantly. And from having 20 or 40 or 68 deaths, in the last four years, there were only four or five deaths. And we still have to work to prevent that. But it has been the work of families that has achieved this dramatic reduction of deaths in the area. That's a remarkable story of how people being organized and after suffering so much pain and grief can have a direct impact on a government that uh, wasn't doing its job before. So you've seen this change since the time of the accident at Pasta de Conchos. And does this organization D is, has it decided to continue with this work? Uh, if it receives the bodies, for example, do you think that it, this work would, would cease? Or what do you see in the future? The families want to live with dignity. 
They have a phrase, our lives matter more than the coal. It's so hard that in this country you haven't even have to say that. But they, they are saying it. So because of that, it's very clear to them. First, recover the body of my husband or my son or my father. There were orphans who were four or five years old when the explosion happened, and now they are entering adolescence, and they're getting involved with the organization. So I want the remains of my loved one. I want the truth of what happened, because what the government said is, is a lie. It's not believable. They say, I want justice for myself, reparation to of the damages, and not uh, exclusively in terms of money. The Labor Secretary under Felipe Calderón, Javier Lozano, who is now an advisor to the candidate Mead, said that the families were only interested in getting money, that their struggles were just about getting money. That's an insult, and it needs to be recognized. It needs, he needs to apologize. But also, they say there need to be guarantees that this does not happen again. And before that happens, even when they get the remains and some kind of justice, the organization will continue to exist, because that's what it's about. And that's what the family says. It's about getting the dead back so there can be life. In Mexico now, mining is rapidly expanding. Uh, did, will this continue to be a local movement, or have they found an echo in places where there have been accidents or where there are concerns in other regions of the country? For the memorial 12 years after, families from the organization came to put an anti-monument in Mexico, Mexico City. And the family said that they were very moved by all the solidarity they received because they said, we're from a small piece of desert. And there, they insult us, they humiliate us, the local media ignores us. And then we came here, and they interview us, and they believe us, and they support us. So they create these networks of solidarity with other struggles. For example, the struggle of the people from Atenco who stood beside the families with the parents of Ayotzinapa, who also have forged alliances, because it's the same pain. But also, there has been support from human rights organizations, human rights networks, from media outlets that give us a voice, and great credibility to the families. So what they say is, I lived in my house, I didn't ask to be taken from my house, I had to leave, and now I'm not going back in. They're not going to corner me again. For them, Pastel Conscious isn't just a mine that exploded anymore. It's not even a coal mining company. What it has become, and this is my personal conviction, all the struggle from the families is bringing us a huge gift for struggle, humility and resistance, a gift of hope, not just for the country, but for humanity, in my opinion. The families will never forget what happened on February 19, 2006, and society has, still hasn't forgotten and Mexican society owes a debt to these families. What can society do to support this struggle? Many things. The first thing is to inform ourselves, get information, read, get in touch with the families. This experience that they've had of so much humiliation, of feeling that there was no one there for them, that the ones who were supposed to protect them betrayed them, now they are very moved when they receive an email, a text message or a Facebook message. We have a Facebook page, it's called Organización Familias Pasta de Conchos. If there's a message that says, I live in Mexico City and I heard about uh, your tragedy and I'm with you, or I live in Oklahoma and I'm with you. You can't imagine how important it is for them to have energy to go forward another day. And of course, people can also support our social media campaigns and the demands to the government communicating with their ambassadors if they're from another country and saying, hey, why don't you ask the Mexican government about this? All of that is really appreciated. 
Well, unfortunately, we've come to the end of the program. Rodrigo Olvera, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks to all of you. And thank you. We'll be back next week on Interviews from Mexico.